Are we ready to begin, audience? All right. Well, then, greetings. Greetings to all of you here. It is my very great pleasure to welcome you to the 12th annual John Paul Stevens Lecture. As I think many of you know, I'm Lolita buckner Innes, and I am the 17th Dean of the University of Colorado Law School. This lecture, sponsored by Colorado Law's Byron R. White Center for the Study of American Constitutional Law, under the directorship of Suzette Malveaux, who is the Moses Lasky Professor of Law and director of the Byron R. White Center, is one that we look forward to all year. The center was founded through the generous bequest of Colorado Law alumnus Ira C. Rothgerber, Jr. And this lecture serves as the cornerstone, or I should say one of the cornerstones, of the great, great programming that goes on at the Byron White Center and at the University of Colorado Law School. The center engages law students, lawyers, judges, and community members in our nation's constitutional conversation. And I think I don't have to tell you that is a conversation that is ever expanding and including so many more people and so many more issues than it used to. Additionally, this year's lecture is brought to you in partnership with several Colorado Law School organizations, such as Outlaw, the Women of Color Collective, and the Asian Pacific American Law Students Association. And I want to pause for a moment just to give a hand to those student organizations because our students are our lifeblood. And we are so very proud and pleased to have your participation and your partnership. We're also grateful to our Diversity Bar Association co-sponsors, the Colorado LGBTQ Bar Association, and the Asian Pacific American Bar Association. As we gather, we honor and acknowledge that the University of Colorado Law School, and indeed the entire University of Colorado campus, is on the ancestral and traditional homelands of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute peoples. Further, we acknowledge the 48 contemporary tribal nations historically tied to the lands that comprise what is now called the state of Colorado. I am so very pleased and honored to see so many engaged members of our community joining us. And by community, I mean our law students, our law staff, our faculty, our alumni, friends in the local community, and beyond that, esteemed members of our broader community. Because when I say Colorado, I see the world. We have people who are not just here present today, but also present virtually from everywhere near and far. And as I like to say, one of the unique silver linings of the COVID crisis is that we have the unique pleasure and privilege of being able to provide the tools and the mechanisms that can bring this kind of programming to the world at large. I want to say a few more words about Professor Suzette Malveaux and thank her for sponsoring and heading this event. Professor Malveaux, as I think many of you know, is a nationally recognized expert on civil rights and complex litigation. And her wide-ranging expertise, cutting-edge scholarship, commitment to innovative teaching, public service, and I might add, law school service, because I think Professor Malveaux um, is someone on whom I have relied intensively, as I have on many of you um, who are here in this room, who are faculty and staff. And I just want to say to Professor Malveaux, thank you, thank you, thank you for all that you do for this institution in every way possible. Now. Let me talk a little bit about this year's speaker. We are very, very greatly privileged to welcome Associate Justice Sabrina McKenna of the Hawaii Supreme Court. With her 2011 appointment to the Hawaii Supreme Court, Justice McKenna became the first openly LGBTQ plus Asian American to serve on a state court of last resort. A supporter of state constitutionalism, Justice McKenna will be co-teaching a course uh, focused on state constitutional law at the University of Hawaii William S. Richardson School of Law in the spring. 
She is also a faculty member of the National Judicial College and an honorary adjunct faculty member of the Jindal Global Law School in Delhi, India. She serves on the Judicial Advisory Board of the George Mason University and Tonin Scalia Law School's Law and Economic Center for Judicial Education and is a member of the Duke Bolch Judicial Institute's LLM in Judicial Studies, class of 25, 2025. Those are just a very few examples of the amazing work that the justice has done and continues to do. You can read more about her impressive background in our program. As I said, I could go on and say very much more. However, that would cut into the time that we very much need and want to hear from our very, very esteemed and distinguished guest. And so I'm going to turn the program over to Professor Malveaux, um, who will have some commentary for us. And so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Malveaux and our esteemed guest, Justice McKenna. Thank you. Welcome, everyone, um, and thank you so much for being here in person and remotely. Um, I am excited to welcome not only our Colorado audience, um, but participants from all over the United States and honestly, all over the world. Uh, we were looking at the registration numbers there in the hundreds, and um, we know that we have participants. We have many folks from Hawaii, trust me. <laughs> at, what time is it in Hawaii? It might be. Okay, you're good, you're good. They're, they're, they're awake and bright and feeling good, I'm sure. Um, we have other folks, though, in other time zones. So we're talking about India, Japan, South Korea, the UK, Ukraine, and Georgia. So this really is an international audience today. And I think that's what happens when you bring in somebody um, of the caliber and of the importance of Justice McKenna. Um, her impact is global. And I think that's what we're feeling today. So I do want to welcome folks, um, not only in this room, but uh, people who are tuning in um, remotely from all over the globe. Um, I am honored to have Justice McKenna uh, join us for the 12th Annual Stevens Lecture on this critical topic. Um, this evening, we are going to be using a fireside chat format um, to discuss the topic state constitutional law the critical course missing from most law school curricula. We are going to be exploring the historical and continued importance of state courts and state constitutions when we think about the protection of civil, criminal, and environmental uh, rights, and especially in, in light of the kinds of recent developments that we've seen on the federal court level. Uh, the fireside chat is then going to be followed by a Q&A with our Colorado Law student leaders who are over here. Um, uh, we will then welcome all of you who are in person to join us at a reception next door uh, immediately following uh, the lecture and the Q&A. And um, that will take us to about uh, 7 o'clock or so. Um, in terms of housekeeping matters, I do want to remind our virtual audience um, that your cameras and your audio are automatically turned off. Um, if you are having some difficulty in terms of IT, feel free to sort of um, mention that in the chat. We will have our IT folks uh, help you with that, but that's sort of the extent of your uh, participation for today. Um, we are definitely going to get out a recording to everyone. You'll get an email, a recording of this um, event today, and I'm also going to send out a survey and really push for you to uh, give feedback, right, so we can make sure that we continue to grow and sort of help us um, uh, continue to do the work we do. So I, I would very much appreciate that. Um, and so without any uh, further ado, uh, Justice McKenna, will you join us for our fireside chat? Welcome to our living room, right? <laughs> All right, so welcome to our living room, right? <laughs> Get comfy. <laughs> All right, I want to just jump right in 
Uh, welcome, aloha. It is so good to see you. Um, such a privilege. Aloha, thank you so much. Um, it's really an honor and privilege. I think I'm getting a little bit of echo. I'm not quite oh, sure. Oh, okay. We are getting a little feedback, so I'm gonna ask our IT people if they can make an adjustment. Testing, one, two, three, testing, one, two, three. I think that's better. Is that better for everyone? Okay, thank you. Okay, are folks he hearing okay? And please um, shout out if you're not. Okay, don't be shy. Uh, so um, I wanna just start uh, right into the meat of the conversation and think about state constitutions and state courts. And we know that on the federal level, um, a number of fundamental rights are being called into question. And by that, I'm thinking about abortion, I'm thinking about voting, I'm thinking about criminal justice. And so for um, many people, they're becoming much more aware of the importance of state constitutions and state courts. Um, and so I'm wondering, what is the role, do you think, of state courts and state constitutions um, at this critical juncture? Well, thank you. First of all, I wanna thank you, Professor uh, Malvo, for uh, focusing on the state constitutions, the Byron White Center. I want to thank all of you, uh, the dean. Um, the Byron White Center is the Center for Study of American Constitutional Law, and I know that I am the second state Supreme Court justice uh, to speak after uh, Judge Lippman, the former chief ju judge justice of the highest court in New York. But State courts, state constitutions have always been extremely important historically. Um, remember that the 13 colonies, which became the 13 states, had their own constitutions before the federal constitution of 1787. And remember that the Bill of Rights in 1791 was based on the Virginia Declaration of Rights. Mm -hmm. And we all talk about Marbury versus Madison in 1803, but judicial review was actually occurring in state Supreme Courts for many years before Marbury versus Madison. And so state courts have always played a very important role. State constitutions have always played a very important role. Um, you know, until uh, 1925, and a constitutional law as we study it now in law school, and even me from 1979 to 82 when I went to law school, we really focused on the federal constitution and federal constitutional rights. I think mainly because after incorporation in 1925, you know, the First Amendment, Yitlow versus uh, New York, um, and as various rights within the Bill of Rights started getting incorporated and applicable, held applicable to the states, um, people really started focusing on the federal constitutional rights. Um, but until uh, 1925, the federal constitutional rights, civil rights, did not apply to state action. Remember that. In 1833, the Baltimore case, mm -hmm. you know, the, the United States Supreme Court held that the Fifth Amendment takings clause was not applicable to state and local governments. And why? There were certain people that were considered property mm -hmm. at the time. Mm -hmm. And so in any event, um, state courts and state constitutions have always been important. Uh, throughout history, um, there's been a dialogue between, I believe, different state courts as well as the United States Supreme Court and other state courts um, on certain provisions. For example, the exclusionary rule um, there was a real dialogue going on between federal courts and state high courts um, until 1961. Uh, by 1961, Mapp versus Ohio, the exclusionary rule, the United States Supreme Court held the exclusionary rule uh, um, applicable to all states through incorporation. But um, by then, half of the states already recognized the exclusionary rule under their own constitution. So in any event, um, We've had a real focus, but based on, because of Dobbs, obviously, um, but uh, Roach versus Common Cause 2019, where the United States Supreme Court said that um, the um, um, racial gerrymandering is non-justiciable, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. said that it's 
possible that there could be claims under state constitutions. And so based on that, there's been so much more focus on uh, the, the state constitutions and state constitutional rights, especially after, and um, obviously Dobbs in, right. in uh, last year's opinion. Right, um, right. Overruling the right to abortion, yes. I think it's such an important thing to note, right, that there are, I think sometimes we forget, right, there's the federal constitution, but the federal constitution is just a floor, mm -hmm. right, and that state, states have their own constitutions and they can in fact provide greater rights. Um, and what's interesting is for states, they can even with their own state constitutions, they can give greater rights even with the language in their state constitution is identical to the federal constitution, state courts can interpret it differently, right? And so that the exclusionary rule and some of these other things are excellent examples of where the states have decided we're giving greater rights, even if that language is identical. Right? Absolutely, so um, and that's mm -hmm. been happening now. Not as much, you know, um, in 1977, uh, former uh, Justice William Brennan of the United States Supreme Court mm -hmm. wrote a very seminal law review piece in the Harvard Law Review called, uh, I think it was entitled uh, State Constitutional Rights. Well, I forgot the title of the, his article, but it he talked about the importance of state courts construing their own constitutions, not in lockstep with SCOTUS interpretations of the sim same or similar constitutional provisions, we call them you know, state analogs of federal constitutional rights, but that state high courts must consider the logic of United States Supreme Court interpretations of rights within uh, state constitutions to see if the state courts should be following that. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, after that, you know, I think there was uh, when you look at, um, th there's been some law review articles written. After that, there were a lot more state courts that started looking at state constitutionalism, uh, apply, interpreting s the same or similar provisions in state constitutions to give greater rights. I will say that uh, the Hawaii Supreme Court recognized this in 1967. As of 1967, our Hawaii Supreme Court was all rec already recognizing uh, that uh, our court could interpret the same language in our constitution to give greater rights to people. Mm -hmm. And I'm not surprised that Justice Brennan took the position he did because he was a New Jersey Supreme Court justice before he joined the federal bench, so that makes, that makes sense. Um, I do wanna turn to the Hawaii constitution because it is so special and it is so unique. Uh, when I read the Hawaii Constitution, it reminds me of the South African Constitution. Um, and we had the privilege of having a couple years ago uh, Justice Yacoub from the South African Constitutional Court uh, give the Stevens Lecture. And, you know, South African Constitution is like a smorgasbord of every right you could ever imagine and want uh, in one document. And, uh, and Hawaii sort of strikes me in a similar way, right, in this country that it is so robust and is so unique. Would you share a little bit about some of those provisions and what makes that constitution so special? Thanks, yes. Well, um, first of all, the Hawaii constitution, like many state constitutions, starts in Article One with uh, a delineation of individual rights. Mm -hmm. And a lot of state constitutions do that. Um, and, but in addition, we have uh, provisions, positive rights that do not exist in other state constitutions. And this is true of many state constitutions. They have rights that are, do not necessarily exist in other state constitutions and definitely not in the federal constitution. But in Hawaii, for example, we have um, a right to a clean and healthful environment. We have a very strong public trust provision in our constitution and which protects all natural resources, not just water, but land and all natural resources, as well as the natural beauty of the state, mm -hmm. which was cited in a very early case uh, in the 60s in which um, in 1967, uh, our court cited to that provision to, to uh, uphold an ordinance prohibiting, basically prohibiting billboards. So you won't see billboards when you come to Hawaii. It's protecting the natural beauty as well as the natural resources. We also have um, 
I'm not sure if other states have this, but we have separate provisions recognizing the right to collective bargaining mm -hmm. for private employees as well as public employees. So I believe we are, I believe we are the most, if not or the second most uh, unionized state in the nation. Um, in addition, very importantly, our constitution was amended in 1978 to add certain provisions for native Hawaiian rights. And this includes the protection of native Hawaiian customary and traditional rights, as well as the right to, an, uh, for the Hawaiian language is considered an official language also. So there is a right to be education in the Hawaiian language. Uh, so things like that. Uh, we do have different rights that don't exist in other constitutions. Yeah, it's amazing. And I also, I wonder, um, I know that every 10 years actually it's put to the voters whether or not it's time for another constitutional convention. And the last one was, what, 1978. Is, do you thinking there might be another one on the horizon? Would, you know, could we see more amendments? Because the 78 one, I think there were maybe 34 amendments. It was amazing. What do you right. think might happen in the future? Any thoughts? <laughs> and, and that question has been put to the electorate uh, every yeah, yeah. 10 years as required by our state constitution. And so far, um, the, uh, a constitutional convention has not been called for because our constitution says that you need 50% okay. of the ballots cast, mm -hmm. not the votes cast. Mm -hmm. It says ballots cast. So uh, there's a Hawaii Supreme Court opinion uh, holding that that provision, ballots cast, means that uh, blank votes are counted as no votes. So, you know, unless you get 50% plus one of all ballots cast, you're not going to have a constitutional amendment. And candidly, every time there's uh, the question is put to the electorate, there have been certain groups that have advocated against another constitutional uh, convention because they're concerned that special interests might put a lot of money into overturning some of the rights we now enjoy. Well, good point, mm -hmm. good point. Um, so, so let me turn to the topic you've actually identified for the fireside chat. This notion, uh, state constitutional law, the critical course missing from most law schools. Um, I'm wondering why you think students should learn state constitutional law. Uh, and I, I had a chance to talk to my colleagues a little bit to find out, do we cover this? Of course, we, we are missing um, one of our giants, Rick Collins, who has the treatise on the, the Colorado state constitution. Um, but in some of, my, some of my colleagues, in fact, are teaching, they're sort of sneaking in state constitutional law into their federal constitutional law classes. But why, why do you think it's so important to have um, state constitution, a, a standalone course, and I understand you're gonna be teaching, so I'm curious what you might put in yours. Great question. Um, so in terms of state constitutional law, I think it's critical because, well, for example, um, there is uh, Judge Jeff Sutton of the Sixth Circuit, who was the Ohio Solicitor General, and is now in the Sixth Circuit and has written several um, textbooks, has, um, describes it as follows because I, I used to play basketball in college, so I like his analogy. He said, he says, imagine you have two free throws. Would you, and, and, the, and the score, you know, you're, you're tied and you have two free throws. Would you only take the first free throw and you miss and not take the second one? You have constitutional rights under the federal <laughs> constitution and the state constitution. So why wouldn't you try to raise the state constitutional law issues? And especially now, because we are in the climate that we are in, mm -hmm. where um, SCOTUS is now kicking things back to the state courts, I think it's really important for students to study state constitutionalism, the history of state constitutions, and how their own state constitutions might play into uh, their cases. So you, I think it's important to understand this. At, you know, I recognize that like when I was in law school, I didn't have a course on state constitutional law, but I did take a course on Native Hawaiian rights, which was based on our state constitution. Um, I had some courses on criminal procedure that brought in some of our crim pro cases the state, under the state constitution. We are much more protective. For example, you need a search warrant to search the, the trash bin outside somebody's home. You can't just, under the federal constitution, you can just, police can search that. But for us, you can't, mm -hmm. for under our constitution, you can't have dogs come sniff 
your car unless there's reasonable suspicion or probable cause that there is something in that car. Mm -hmm. So we, we don't just, you know, we're, ve we're very protective of criminal procedural rights. So people need to know that. It's not true of every single state, but to the extent your state courts haven't addressed these issues, you should be raising these issues. So you should be studying your constitutions, no matter where you are, study the state constitution where you are and consider raising these issues in the cases that you are arguing. Yeah, yeah, and I love uh, the basketball analogy. I know that works for you. <laughs> it works really she well was for me. On the, it works she really was, well she was on the first uh, women's basketball team at the University of Hawaii uh, <laughs> because of Title IX. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Shout out, right? Um, well, yeah, it's not just you know, it's not just me. You know, Professor Robert Williams, who teaches, who has several textbooks and treatises on constitutional law, and uh, Professor Sutton, men, men, um, Judge Sutton, mentioned in his uh, book, uh, his 2018 book, there were less than 20 law schools teaching state constitutional law at that time, right? Um, and there's several professors, I think Margolis and uh, Carpenter, I believe, that are doing a piece uh, studying how many law schools out of about the 200 ABA accredited law schools are now teaching. I think their latest st st statistics show about 70 law schools. We're up to about 70 oh, wow. compared to less than 20 in 2018. So there's been a meteoric, meteoric rise in the number of law schools teaching state constitutional law, but it's still only 70 out of 200. So we still have a way to go. Right, right. I wanna shift our focus a little bit to some substantive topics um, and turn our attention to environmental uh, uh, protection, climate change. Um, certainly, you know, something that is an ex existential crisis on many of our minds, uh, the total number of climate cases since 2017 has doubled. And um, we're seeing cases worldwide in terms of uh, litigation. And I thought last year, and I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about this case, the Hawaii Supreme Court came out, not last, 2023, came out with a case that was absolutely extraordinary, finding an affirmative right to a life-sustaining climate system under the Hawaii Constitution. Not only an affirmative right, but also one that is evolving. So one of the, um, the, the quotes that came out of the court I really liked is, yesterday's good enough has become today's unacceptable. Um, and so can you talk a little bit about the role of state courts when it comes to addressing the issue of climate change? Climate change is, in my view, the most important issue facing all courts in the world at this point. It is an existential threat. Mm -hmm. If we get to three degrees, we're already at 1.2 uh, degrees centigrade. Uh, the wor world is heating up. If we get to th three degrees, most of Honolulu is going under water. Uh, Miami's going under water. Rio de Janeiro is going under water. Um, I think New Orleans, um, so many, and Calcutta and Karachi with millions and millions of people will become uninhabitable because of the heat. Bangladesh will become uninhabitable. There's gonna be great hundreds of millions of people migrating, climate migration. Um, and I think it's an issue that everyone needs to address. Now, in Hawaii, we do have an explicit right to a clean and healthful environment. Um, other state courts, other state constitutions also contain uh, this right. Um, there are others, about 42 state constitutions contain some sort of environmental right or uh, natural resources or public trust rights. Um, and the reality is that the federal courts at this point have not been that open to uh, litigation involving climate change, whether it's the uh, Second Circuit opinion uh, in um, the city of New York versus BP, I believe it was, as well as the Ninth Circuit opinion in the Juliana case. Um, federal courts have been holding these issues non-justiciable, um, but uh, some state courts, including the recent Montana trial court decision based on the Montana a right to a clean and healthful environment are allowing uh, different types of claims to go forward. You know, in terms of um, 
environmental, climate change and environmental rights. You have the constitutions, you have statutory rights, you have regulatory rights, and another way of control is traditional tort litigation. Tort litigation is a method of regulatory control of things that harm people or our, our communities. And so uh, there's just a lot of groundbreaking litigation that's happening now. Um, I can't comment because we do have some pending cases on some of these issues, uh, but um, um, I think you know these are issues that I believe more and more advocates will be raising. Great, thank you. Um, one of the other areas of law that I think Hawaii is, uh, is at the forefront of, right, has been um, same-sex marriage. Uh, and as you know, back in 1993, the Hawaii Supreme Court, I think, was the first court in the world <laughs> to, uh, to rule that denial of same-sex marriage could constitute a constitutional violation, right? Looking at the Hawaii Constitution, and the Equal Protection Clause uh, in particular, and also uh, discrimination on the basis of sex, and in fact, uh, applying strict, strict scrutiny to sex, um, unlike the, the, the federal court system. Um, and so, so Hawaii has been sort of at the forefront of that, um, of that thinking. Fast forward, we know more than two decades later, the United States Supreme Court in Obergefell held that states were required to license and recognize same-sex marriage. Um, why do you think it is that the Hawaii Supreme Court was sort of so forward, right, so ahead, maybe ahead of its time, or certainly ahead uh, 20 years, more than 20 years ahead of everyone else? Very good question. Um, I think that uh, Hawaii has always enjoyed, especially since the 1978 constitutional amendments that created a judicial selection commission with a nominating commission merit selection process. Um, and we're the only state in which judges do not, um, I shouldn't say we're the only state in which, in our state, uh, retention, we're appointed for 10 year terms, we go back to the commission for retention. Like in many states, you have to go through the electorate for retention, but we don't have to. So um, I think Hawaii has always enjoyed a fairly uh, independent judiciary. And, um, um, you know, justice, uh, I, I said that in 1967, our Supreme Court recognized the right for our courts to, uh, to give greater rights under our constitution. That was the first Justice Levinson. And then we have the second Justice Levinson who wrote the Bayer versus Lewin opinion uh, uh, saying that based on our right to uh, disallowing sex-based discrimination, that denial of sex, uh, same-sex marriage was sex-based discrimination, which is what Obergefell held 22 years ago. Um, so I, I think it's because of the independent judiciary. I also think it's cultural. Mm. I think uh, in Hawaii, um, we have, we are the, we are a very pluralistic state. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of immigrants. Uh, I believe we are the only state in which um, white people are not, do not constitute a majority. Um, we are imbued with native Hawaiian culture and traditions, which, um, Native Hawaiians always recognized a third gender, a mahu. Um, I also understand that in traditional Hawaii, same-sex relationships were accepted. It wasn't something, and you know, what, it, they weren't traditionally Christian, right? So, um, although Hawaii did turn to Christianity from the 1800s, so I think it's a it's a confluence of many factors. Yeah. Yeah, it reminds me of your focus on diversity. And I'm wondering if you can share with us, um, you have said that diversity is a requirement of rule of law. What do you mean by that? And why, why is that so important? I've been talking about this a lot recently. Yeah. Um, what is the rule of law, right? I've been thinking, you know, we all, all talk about what is the rule of law. So I, uh, I went online and there's this wonderful organization called the World Justice Project, and it was uh, created by a former ABA president, William Newcomb, and you should see, go to the website, it's like a who's who, international leaders, and a lot of wonderful people got together and thought about 
what is the rule of law, and then they and they actually evaluate all countries annually on, uh, on conformance with the rule of law. But in any event, these thought leaders came up with four principles of the rule of law. And the first is um, accountability. Private and public actors are accountable under the law. The second is just law, that laws have to be open and just and fairly, fairly applied. I'm paraphrasing. Third is open government, that government needs to be open and transparent and accessible. And the fourth is accessible and impartial dispute resolution. And under this principle, it says justice has to be timely delivered by neutrals, judges, who are competent, ethical, <coughs> and independent, and have adequate resources, and represent the communities they serve. So in other words, this think tank, this organization, defines the rule of law as requiring diversity and requiring judges to represent the communities they serve. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm now talking about this as a requirement of the rule of law. That's excellent. Um, I have one more question. My students are going to kill me if I don't get to them. <laughs> it's their turn. So uh, one quickie. Um, you've been a trailblazer all of your life uh, and in so many ways, right? Whether it's the first women's basketball team at University of Hawaii um, or the first openly LGBTQ judge um, to sit on the Hawaii Supreme Court. So I'm just curious uh, what that's been like for you and if anyone has inspired you. I was definitely inspired by Representative Patsy Takemoto Mink, who was the co-sponsor and principal author and co-sponsor of Title IX, because when I walked onto the University of Hawaii Wahine bas women's basketball team, it was the first intercollegiate, intercollegiate basketball team in 1974. I made the team and the coach offered me a scholarship and I said, what, why would I get a scholarship? And she said, Title IX. And I found out about Title IX and how it said that, uh, uh, educational institutions receiving federal funds could not discriminate on the basis of sex, and which I don't think when it passed Congress, uh, the Congress people did not realize it was <laughs> going to apply to sports. And let me tell you, there was a movement to try to exclude sports, but ju uh, Congresswoman Mink fought that and got kept sports and athletics within it. But because of Title IX, you know, I was. Uh, able to uh, go to law school and, and go to get a, call, a scholarship for undergrad and then go to law school. With, in 1972, only 7% of US law school graduates were women. Women were routinely discriminated against. So Patsy Mink, who couldn't get into med school because she was a woman, was able to get into the University of Chicago under, under their international quota, um, even though Hawaii was a territory. Don't. I don't understand that, <laughs> but fortunately, she was one of two women in her class and got through, and she was this wonderful first woman of color to serve in Congress, and so she was my major inspiration, absolutely. Wow, yeah. excellent, excellent. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I am going to shift us and turn our attention to the student, the student uh, leaders today to also ask their questions. And so I, first of all, I just want to thank you for that fireside chat. I really appreciate your insights and your wisdom and uh, sharing so much. All right, let me um, uh, bring up our first student, Rhea Roussel. So uh, Rhea is representing the Women of Color uh, Collective. She's a second year law student from Dallas. She is a fellow at the Byron White Center, and she has a background in arts and education. She's interested in civil rights, education, and employment law. So welcome, Rhea. Get us started. Hi. Thank you so much, Professor Malvo. And welcome, Justice McKenna. Thank you. So talking about Title IX. So Title IX has opened up doors for women in athletics, academics, and law school, yourself included, of course. Um, so now that women represent over 50% of law school graduates, what can we expect now? And what are some challenges that still exist? Great question. So as I mentioned, in 1972, only 7% uh, of law school graduates were women. I think Hawaii only had one woman judge at the time. Mm -hmm. And as the percentage of women increased, uh, we now have 50% of our state court judges are women. 
Um, so obviously, with the number of uh, women increasing in the legal profession, I believe 44% in Hawaii now are women. I think it's, I can't remember, ABA nationally, I think it's more like 35 to 40% of attorneys. So we are seeing women rise up through the ranks, right? But the challenges I see, uh, one real big concern that I see is in terms of law firms. You see a lot of women uh, not making it to the equity partner level, especially women of color. And um, so that is a major concern. I, I'm not quite sure what all the factors are with respect to that, but you know the the kind of the the hours and the schedules that are expected in big law, I think, become a big factor. I also think that implicit bias is a factor. I think that we all need to recognize that we all have implicit biases. You know, we I took the uh, implicit bias test. Uh, IAT, uh, the Harvard Implicit Association Test, uh, in our first judicial implicit bias training, I did it in front of all the state court judges in Hawaii, and I came out biased against women working women. I came out biased, and I've done the tests myself. I am biased against people of color. I have implicit bias against LGBTQ people because this is the way I grew up. So rec we need to recognize that we can even be biased against ourselves, okay? Um, but so I think that, uh, I think these are the challenges that we face. Um, and I, I uh, along with like uh, Justice Marquez of the Colorado Supreme Court headed your task force on well-being, I headed our task force on well-being. I think we need to focus on well-being and creating avenues where women can become more fully integrated into the practice of law. Great, thank you. Our next student, Matt Engerbretson, um, who is representing the Byron White Center as a fellow. Matt is a 2L student, first gen college student with career interest in intellectual property and international business law. Um, this summer, he worked at the Denver Public Defender's Office and is passionate about the ways that technology can give um, access to justice to underserved communities. So welcome back. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you, Justice McKenna, Professor Malvo, for that um, truly enlightening discussion. I'm sure I speak for everyone here when I say that. So my question for you, Justice McKenna, is um, so first, has Hawaii's colonial history and then eventual statehood impacted the way that you and your colleagues on the court interpret your state's constitution? And if so, how? That is a very good question. Um, you're right. Hawaii was colonized like many other places. Um, it's really important to recognize that Hawaii was an independent kingdom um, until 1893. Um, the, Hawaii was unified in 1810 by King Kamehameha I, and then in 1839, King Kamehameha III um, um, issued a Declaration of Rights, and in 1840 promulgated a constitution with three branches of government. Of course, he as the unitary executive right, the king as a unitary executive, but creating not a how, the Senate, which was a house of nobles, and then a house of representatives for the, the common people. And so Hawaii since 1840 has had this, had, has had a U, similar to the US-based constitution. Um, and um, I, the king was wise, recognized that in order to be recognized by other countries, because there were, incursions and people trying to, you know, gain control. Different countries were interested in, in Hawaii, Japan, Russia, England, France, and the United States were interested in Hawaii, strategic location. But the king, so the king promulgated a constitution and we had this. Then um, the, and then because we had this constitution and the Hawaiian people were extremely literate. The Iolani Palace uh, in Hawaii had electricity and telephones before the White House. Um, 
the, and in any event, um, the United States had a treaty with Hawaii, but uh, with the help of the United States military forces, business people overthrew the queen, Liliuokalani, in 1893. And after that, Hawaii was colonized, really, until statehood in 1959. Now, um, the territorial courts, um, there were territorial courts created, but of course, the judges were appointed from the DC area. Um, some, a lot of people were local people that were appointed. It wasn't as bad as in some of the other territories. But, um, you know, there, there were big, there were these plantations that kind of took over the economy. Uh, people, they brought in a lot of immigrants from China, Japan, Philippines to serve as laborers because the Hawaiians were killed off due to diseases. So many Hawaiians died due to Western diseases that were brought in. Um, so there weren't enough workers for the pi pineapple and the sugar plantation. So they brought in all these immigrants who were almost like indentured servants, you know? Um, and uh, so in any event, um, the, um, there was discrimination really and so after Hawaii, there were a lot of people in Hawaii that pushed for statehood. Not everyone, there were some Native Hawaiians that I'm sure did not want statehood, but there were a lot of people that wanted statehood so that we could uh, be more independent and more people could recognize rights. So I think that when uh, statehood came and then uh, we have this independent judiciary. I think we are informed by our colonial history, the subjugation of the different people, the fact that we aren't, we, ha we are a majority minority state and there's no majority. So we all have to learn how to get along and live together. Um, and so, yeah, I think this, that does inform, the colonial history does inform our decision making. Great, thank you, thank you. Um, I'd like to introduce Adora Batero. Uh, Adora is representing Outlaw as its president. Adora is the 2L, an active member of NALSA. They are currently my research assistant, so thank you. <laughs> um, working on projects related to due process and race and sex is also the research assistant for, for, for Professor Scott Skinner Thompson on work about the rise of anti-transgender legislation. Uh, what's most amazing is Adora has read 103 fiction novels this year. So I don't even understand how it's that's possible. It's 102. I thought I'd finish one more today. I didn't get around to it. 102. How do you stop the time? <laughs> okay. You know, so I, I don't sleep. <laughs> you um, have a question from Adora. I do. I do have a question. Uh, I'm going to turn a little bit more personal, if that's all right. Uh, Justin McKenna, you recently were awarded um, the Stonewall Award from the ABA Commission on Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity for championing LGBT, um, championing the LGBT community within the legal profession and around the world. So I first, I just wanted to uh, congratulate you on that. Um, came out to your family and then later your colleagues in 1991. What motivated you to make that decision and what have you learned that we can learn from you? Well, thank you, Adora, for that question. Um, things were really different in my youth. Remember, it, what I graduated from high school in 1974, and in 1973, it was when I was a senior in high school that the American Psychological Association removed uh, same-sex attractions, sexual orientation, from the list of mental illnesses under uh, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. So uh, growing up, uh, being gay was a mental illness. Um, so things were really different. Um, you know, people were very closeted uh, when I was in college uh, and beyond. And I was comfortable coming out in 1991 at work uh, when I started teaching at the law school because Hawaii became the third state to pass legislation prohibiting uh, sexual orientation employment discrimination. And so the law made me very comfortable coming out, especially because I was at a law school. I figured the law school would follow the law, right? That's all. <laughs> and, uh, and so, uh, but I wasn't comfortable coming out at work before that because I wasn't sure at the law firm because I wasn't sure what would happen to me. So, you know, laws can make a difference, right? Laws do make a difference. They're empowering. 
Um, so, um, yeah, what, what was the rest of his question? What have you learned that can help us? Because now, being a lesbian is much more accepted now. Right. right. Coming out as transgender in the workplace is still terrifying. Yeah. Yes, and we can imagine. Right, so the question is, what can, uh, what can we learn? What can, uh, things are different, and it, right now there's so much anti-transgender uh, legislation, and I, I'm just devastated by it. I, it's painful. I'm really fortunate to come from a state that is, we have, a, I think, an enlightened legislature. And so, you know, some of these issues don't have to come to our court because the legislature takes care of it. We were the first state in 1970 to legalize abortion, three years before Roe versus Wade. We were the first state to legalize it. And, so, and in terms of transgender or sexual orientation, um, gender identity legislation, our state is extremely progressive. So, I, so but I think it's, it, was, it was important for me to come out uh, to provide hope and a representation to my community, especially as an Asian American. Uh, Asian Americans have a little bit more discrimination happening on the LGBTQ side. Mm. Um, and so I thought it was really important for me to be out. Um, but I think what's really important is to live your authentic self because I remember the terror, the terror that I felt wondering if I would be outed before I came out, and it, it's, not, it's not healthy. So it's, no matter what it is, I think it's important to be honest with yourself. And you have to, be, you have to protect yourself, you have to be protective. But you know, I didn't come out until the law protected me, but, so, but it's important to be honest with yourself, people that you're close to, and um, fortunately, I think we are in uh, an age that most peop more people are, exposure and representation is so important. And I'm hopeful that people understand these issues so much better. But, uh, you know, I'm still hopeful for the future. I am hopeful for the future. Thank you, mm -hmm. Thank you for that question. Um, they have been a leader in this area, so we're very Wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to welcome Malia Eastman, who is representing APALSA, the Asian Pacific American Law Students Association. Uh, Malia is a third year law student, has held leadership positions in multiple student organizations throughout the law school. Her professional interests include criminal defense and trademark law. Uh, well, welcome, Malia. Hi, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to ask a question and thank you for being here today. Um, this is something you spoke a little to already, but as someone of Native Hawaiian descent myself, I'm really interested in how Native Hawaiian and indigenous culture and values have impacted Hawaii's constitution or maybe even how they've impacted your approach to your role? Excellent question, aloha. Thank you for being here. Um, definitely, you know, the, like I said, I think that the, and let me just say, we have a statute, HRS, Hawaii Revised Statute 5-7.5, .5, that codifies the aloha spirit and says that all government leaders, including judges, can and should consider the aloha spirit when making our decisions. So in that way, we, it's, it's statutorily prescribed for us to consider. But in terms of our constitution, we recognize, like I said, the 1978 <clears throat> amendments recognizing traditional and customary rights. We have decisions holding, uh, and our public trust resources especially, are recognized Native Hawaiian traditional uh, concepts. For example, we have no private beaches. Mm. Our, our Supreme Court held years ago that um, the, uh, uh, the shoreline up to the upper wash of the uh, waves is public property. So we have no private property. Our beaches are public, so you will not have public beaches if you come visit us in Hawaii. Um, we, um, we recognize that uh, the water cannot be owned by anyone under our constitution. It is a public trust resource. Even the water can be allocated, but it's, it can be changed depending on the needs of the community. We have a water code, a water commission. Water is a public trust resource. Uh, water is why in Hawaiian. Why, 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 why is 
means wealth in Hawaiian. Mm. Water is wealth. Water is the key to everything. I think Colorado recognizes that too. Um, so in any event, Native Hawaiian concepts, and I, for example, I have cited to the preamble of our constitution saying that, you know, being a Hawaiian, Hawaiian sense of place, you know, um, we have to act in a way that is uh, consistent with our state motto, the life of the land is perpetuated in righteousness. We have to be pono, we have to be righteous, we have to be right. We have to do things for the right reason. So these concepts, I believe, permeate our decision making. Yeah, your preamble is beautiful. <laughs> it's just so loving, right, when you read it, so I, I understand. Um, thank you for that. Our next student, Evan Mahan, who is representing the Colorado LGBT Bar Association. Evan's a 3L at uh, the law school and past president of Outlaw. After law school, he'll be working as an intellectual property associate at a law firm in Denver. Welcome, Evan. Thank you. And thank you for being here. Thank you. You have had the opportunity to work in private practice, in-house, as a law professor, and now as a justice. What motivated you to join the legal profession and ultimately become a justice on the Hawaii Supreme Court? Thank you. Good question. Well, uh, like I mentioned, Title IX, Patsy Mink, was, I was very inspired. And then when I was playing uh, um, basketball, one of my volleyball friends, who was the first woman to receive the Scholar Athlete Award, uh, Marilyn Moniz, um, she started law school in 79 and 76 three years ahead of me. And I thought, well, gee, athletes can go to law school. <laughs> now, I was uh, going to undergrad thinking I was going to be a Japanese English interpreter. But um, I decided I didn't just want to interpret what other people have to say. But perhaps I could help people have a voice, perhaps have a voice myself. So I decided to go into law, especially seeing the power of the law after Title IX. And then, um, you know, based on everything that I went through in my life and my background, I decided after my in-house position, I decided I really wanted to be, uh, be a judge because when I was a 1L, my, uh, one of my adjunct professors was appointed to the bench and that's when I realized, well, lawyers become judges and then maybe that's something I could aspire to. Uh, but the first time I applied, I didn't make the list. Um, um, and I was fortunate to be, get the uh, assistant professorship at the law school. But the second time I applied, two and a half years later, I did make the list and I was selected. But I worked myself up from the Court of Limited Jurisdiction. And people ask me, what was your favorite job? And I say, my favorite job was a job that I had at the time I had it. Because <laughs> it's been a progression. There's no way I could have gone from law school to become a United, uh, Hawaii Supreme Court Justice. I had to go through these different steps. I learned something every single time in every position. I started at the lower courts. I went to the court of general jurisdiction. I did criminal law. I did civil law. And I did family court cases. I headed the family court. I learned so much. And that's when I thought, well, I was applying to appellate court for many times. But, but um, I think it was a, a twist and turn. You know, life is a process. It's like a river. Um, but I, uh, I feel just very honored to be here. I didn't expect to be here. I never, let me just tell you, all the law students here, you can, you can and you, it sounds trite, but you can do anything. You can become anything. Don't sell yourself short. Do not think that your first job is going to be your last job. It, and if it is your last job, that's wonderful. So glad you found something that, you know, that you can be passionate about. But... The beauty of the law is that you get to try different things and, and you can make a difference in so many different ways. Thank you. Thank you. Our last student, last but not least, Leo Wen, who is representing APABA, the Asian Pacific American Bar Association. Leo is a third year law student here. His professional interests are in health law, appellate litigation, and privacy law. He's a 3L advisor for the for, um, uh, Apulsa, and he was the president of Apulsa not too long ago last year. So welcome, Leo. Thank you, Professor Malvo, and thank you, Justice McKenna, for joining us tonight. Justice McKenna, you alluded a little bit to this in your last answer, but I wanted to ask you about um, how you've applied to be on the Hawaii Supreme Court several times, often making the short list but not getting the position. Can you tell us more about that? And 
What has given you hope and determination to persevere and ultimately become a unanimous shoe-in for the position? Thank you so much. Um, yes, um, I applied to uh, the Hawaii Supreme Court several times. Um, I told you the first time I applied for a judgeship, I didn't make the list. I, I did become a trial court judge. And when I became a general jurisdiction trial court judge in 1995, from 2000, I started applying to our, our appellate courts and our Supreme Court and federal court. And I made almost every list of finalists, but I was never selected. But I did persevere. And I think one of the reasons I persevered was I wanted to set an example for my children too. I have three wonderful children, uh, but for the young people also, because one of the regrets that I have, and I shouldn't call it a regret, but in seventh grade, I applied to be vice president. I ran for vice president of our student council and an eighth grader one, and I, I didn't make it. And I never ran for student council again. Mm. And, and when I look back on my life, I'm like, I should have. That, was a, <laughs> that would have been a natural for me. I should have run for student government. The one. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. And maybe later <laughs> on, I might have had a better chance. But I didn't. And so I realized that you, you just need to keep trying. But also that, you know, I think that, um, when you have opportunities, all you law students and you young lawyers out there, when there are different opportunities, it's scary. It's, it feels personal. It feels like rejection. But no, you have to keep trying. You have to keep offering yourself. When you know that you have the skills and the abilities, have the confidence in yourself, especially the women, because women tend not to apply unless they meet 110% of the MQs, whereas men will apply even if they only meet 60% of the MQs. So let me tell you that when I was uh, heading the committee on per diem judges, we had you know, male attorneys apply who had never stepped foot in a, in a courtroom. And I, and I was like, you think you can be a judge and you've never even been in a courtroom? <laughs> whereas we had these remarkable women applying to be a per diem, which is a pro tem judge, um, part-time judge, and I'm like, why are you applying to be a part-time judge? You should be applying for the court of general jurisdiction right now. But in any event, have confidence in yourself and know that you have something to offer. And offer yourself, especially in pub the public interest or courts or you know, that ways in which you can help the community. Um, so that was my theory, that I thought I had something to contribute. I thought I could do the job. That, and I was going to keep applying. And fortunately, but I was, I kept telling myself, I'm so honored and privileged to have the job that I had at the time, whether it was the lowest court or the general jurisdiction trial court or heading family court. And I was, you know, I was like, God, I would have been thrilled 30 years ago to have the job that I have now. So, you know, if I become a Hawaii State Supreme Court justice, that's just a bonus on top of everything. And I'm really honored to be in this position. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, that wraps up our portion of the Q&A and the fireside chat. So I want to give just a, a really hearty round of applause for your <laughs> participation. Well, I'm going to grab you something. Hold on for a second. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Mahalo nuni loa. <laughs>